We've all got the same 24 hours in a day. What you do with it is up to you, and the supplement you take can help you make every hour count. For the maintenance of good health, choose DS24. DS24 provides the perfect balance of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and essential fatty acids to make every day your best day. Your life demands DS. DS24 multivitamin and mineral daily supplement. Find the full DS range at all good pharmacies. Welcome to the Wishes Running Group or Interest Group evening. Tonight we are talking about plantar fasciitis for our Wish webinar Wednesday. Um, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, Asino, tonight. And if you have any questions, you can pop them onto the online Q&A tab. And I know that we are welcome to a whole lot of people in person for the first time in Cape Town, which we're quite excited about. So welcome, Cape Town. Um, tonight we have two really, really phenomenal speakers, and I'm, I'm, I'm truly privileged to work with both of them. Um, the hot topic of plantar fasciitis is something that I'm sure we've all dealt with, and it's a, it's a tricky one. So I think we're going to have some great insight tonight. Our first speaker is Prof. John Patricius, who I'm sure you all know very well if you've been involved with WISH or in any kind of sports. If you don't, what rock are you living under? Uh, Prof. Patricius has been in the sports medicine industry for 27 years. He is currently director of the Waterfall Sports Orthopedic Surgery in Johannesburg and professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences, the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, where he leads the WISH research group. John is the founder and director of Sports Concussion South Africa, sports, and he's a sports concussion consultant to World Rugby, a board member of the International Concussion and Sports Group, and on the scientific committee for the International Con Consensus Conference on Concussion and Sport. Um, he is a fellow in the, of the American um, College of Sports Medicine and the Faculty of Sports Medicine in the UK and the International Sports Medicine Federation. He's also an editor of the British Journal of um, Sports Medicine. He's, he served in um, the South African Sports Medicine Association as well, and he's been involved in every kind of sport that you can think of. Thanks, John, for joining us tonight, and take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Lauren, um, for that introduction. Thank you very much again to Robin for all the background technical work. Uh, especially today as we joined by our colleagues in Cape Town. Thank you to the Cape Town team as well for linking up and for giving of your time this evening to join us uh, at Sports Science Institute. I think it's a great initiative and it's always wonderful to participate in these collaborations. So uh, very excited to be here this evening. Um, although I wasn't so excited the last few days scrambling to get a talk together and uh, I did curse Lauren once or twice uh, for asking me strategically some time ago before I realized what commitments I had. But it's a really a pleasure to speak to you. And, you know, on a topic that I think is something we're all familiar with. If you work in sport and exercise medicine, and especially if you deal with runners, then it's a condition that you will face, if not daily, then certainly weekly. So I'm not an expert on the foot or on plantar fasciitis. I think there are more of those uh, in the Cape Town uh, studio there than, than there are in, in my study at the moment. But uh, I'm very happy to share with you some perspectives on this condition of plantar fasciitis, which I think we can all agree is, is a very difficult one often to manage. And so I've labeled my talk plantar fasciitis, why it's our nemesis. And I'm going to talk a little bit to the clinician's perspective as to why we might be battling to manage this condition and how we should set our expectations as well as those of the athletes. So this is a, a painting by an artist called Joe Bishop, who John. labeled it Funny Feet. But I think those of us that deal with plantar fasciitis uh, will certainly appreciate that it can be anything but funny. And that was highlighted to me in the last week when my receptionist gave me my daily list of patients and she always puts there what the patient's provisional diagnosis is. 
And in the case of this patient that she listed in the middle of my clinic, she wrote that the patient has hell pain. Now, mm -hmm. it was obviously a malatropism and a misspelling, but I thought it was probably quite appropriate in, in that it probably summarizes better the way most plantar fasciitis presents to us. John, you're not yes. sharing your screen yet. If you can just share Yeah. So have you not seen anything yet? Not yet, but you've been speaking very well. Okay. So you've painted the picture for us. All right. So let me just check why it's not sharing. Uh, let me go back onto that and see. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Here we go. Now we can see. Great. So there's the painting I was talking to, to you about, the funny feet painting by Joe Bishop and uh, the health pain that is probably a more appropriate term. So when we talk about a nemesis, uh, it really is something that goes back, like most good things, to ancient Greece. And it really talks about uh, being given what you do. And I often wonder when I get one of these very challenging heel pains, what uh, I've done to deserve this. Uh, nemesis was the goddess of retribution, and divine retribution was a theme in the Hellenic world. And if you treat feet, it's probably a theme in many of your clinics as well. So the area we're talking about, I think, is familiar to all of you, particularly podiatrists. You know the area very well. We're dealing with a dense fibrous aponeurosis that spans the foot with its origin at the tubercle of the calcaneus. It attaches at the proximal phalanges, it has a thicker central portion and thinner medial and lateral bands, and it's described as maintaining the arches of the foot. Now that's quite a stylistic, theoretical version of, of what the plantar fascia does. If we delve a bit deeper, we'll see that it's actually quite a complex structure. And the theme of my talk is going to really dwell on two things. One is that it has a distinct biomechanical function, and I'm going to leave that up to Sean to really elucidate in a lot more detail. But it's, it's, it has a, a significant biomechanical function, and we'll, we'll touch on that. And the second aspect is that it has a really quite complicated and more detailed anatomy, and in particular histology, than we perhaps give it credit for. And if we appreciate those two things, then we might understand why the plantar fascia can give us so much trouble. So this pearly white tissue has longitudinal fibers, which are really intimately attached to the skin, it has a central portion, which is thickest and attaches to the medial pro process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus. And distally, it has five slips, one for each toe. The plantar fascia prevents foot collapse, not just because of its structure, but by virtue of its anatomical orientation, its tensile strength, and its mechanical function, which we'll talk about. That mechanical function is described by a sailing term, the windless effect. And for those of you that don't know, I'm gonna let out a state secret, and that is that Lauren Brown is actually a champion sailor, and she can talk to you a little bit about the exploits that her and her family have got up to. And she's probably a good person to talk about what a windlass is in, in sailing terms. But as I understand it, it's a tightening of a rope or cable. And the plantar fascia, plantar fascia simulates this cable as it is attached to the calcaneus and the metatarsophalangeal joints. During dorsiflexion, during the prof prop propulsive phase of the gait, it winds the plantar fascia around the head of the metatarsal and simulates that wind, windless effect. And this winding of the plantar fascia shortens the distance between the calcaneus and the metatarsals, as illustrated here uh, on this diagram. And that elevates the medial longitudinal arch. So it has a distinct mechanical function uh, by shortening uh, that results from that hallux dorsiflexion, an endless simulating that windless mechanism of the tightening of a rope uh, or cable. And so I think we often just uh, categorize the plantar fascia as another fascia, another tendon-like structure. And I think there's a lot more to it 
partly because of its biomechanical effect. And if you want to read an article that describes this in a little bit more detail, here's a good article uh, that's nearly 20 years old from the Journal of Athletic Training, but it describes that windless mechanism quite nicely and explains the biomechanical link, which we probably need to understand if we're going to deal with this injury. Sean's going to talk to this in a lot more detail in terms of the biomechanics of the foot and how that influences the plantar fascia. So I'm not going to dwell on it, but the point I want to make is that there are distinct biomechanical forces which uh, create a specific injury propensity at the origin of the plantar fascia. The other point I want to make, and Sean will again, I'm sure, allude to this, is the uniqueness of our feet. And so although we're describing a mechanism which is common to all of us, the biomechanical forces will be different just by the very nature of our different foot arch types and the sizes of our feet and the stresses on our feet. So it's no wonder that we often get inconsistent responses to, to a fairly consistent treatment approach if that's going to be the way we embrace plantar fasciopathy. So to understand that there's a biomechanical mechanism which is well described, but it may differ in terms of the forces applied to the origin of the plantar fascia because of the uniqueness of our foot. So the biomechanical stresses is one aspect and the unique biomechanical mechanism of the plantar fascia is one aspect, but I want to dwell a little bit on the anatomy because I think that explains a lot on what goes on at a cellular level in describing the plantar fascia injury. So the plantar fascia is actually more than just a fascia. It's certainly more than just a tendon. It's actually an enthesis when we're talking about the area that's injured. It's a thick periosteal fibre cartilage, okay, on the superior tuberosity of the calcaneus. So if we look at it in a very much more detailed histological fashion, you can see that this is the calcaneus here, this whitish red area with a calcaneal spur. And the microscopic structure is very nicely elucidated in this slide with the red arrows showing a fibrous part of the plantar fascia and the yellow arrows showing what is actually a fibro cartilage uh, most abundant at the sites of greatest compression of the plantar fascia. And then the blue arrows show the development of an extension of the calcaneus in the form of a bony spur, which we are all familiar with and which I'll cover in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. But this type of work really shows us that we're dealing with a collection of re related tissues at and near the enthesis, enthesis being a tender or fascia insertion, which serve a common function of stress dissipation. And I think if we look at it in this sort of complex fashion, then it becomes clearer why this problem is often very difficult to manage. I spoke a little bit about the spurs and here's a, a nice series of images showing the development of spurs of different sizes at the plantar fascia, uh, progressively increasing from, in size from left to right and the asterisk actually showing the enthesis. Now, if you look at where that enthesis is, it's actually over the top of the spur and not directly related to it from a mechanical point of view. And the actual theory is that the spurs help to dissipate loads from the plantar fascia when it's been compressed against the ground and aren't necessarily part of the pathology itself. We've all seen patients who have spurs, which we find incidentally on x-ray in different parts of the body, including the calcaneus, which don't actually uh, lend any symptomatology at all. So onto the plantar fascia itself, I'm gonna come a little bit back to the histology once we've dealt with it. What it is, it's a degenerative condition of the plantar in thesis. So that's really what we're dealing with, is, is, is an enthesis which has become damaged through a process of degeneration. And we're familiar with that process of degeneration in the soft tissue around the Achilles, patella tendons, elbows, extensive flex and flexor origin uh, tendinopathies. And a, a degeneration is simply a condition of a tissue which has its vitality diminished 
So we're substituting an originally high functioning tissue with a form of tissue which is of lower function. That's by definition what histological degeneration is. So theoretically, should we be calling it a plantar fasciopathy? Or probably more correctly, what we should be referring to is plantar enthesopathy. That would be the correct term with what, for what we're dealing with. It's a degenerative condition of the tissues at the plantar in thesis. The pathophysiology is that you have a cumulative stress overload that causes micro tears and chronic collagen degeneration and damage to some of the other in thesis structures at the origin of the plantar fascia. Uh, it can be on other areas. We've all seen it slightly further along the plantar fascia, but most commonly at the origin. And it's most often seen as part of an overuse syndrome following changes in training, training regimen, as well as other extrinsic and intrinsic causes. This is the pathohistology that I referred to earlier. This work was done by a group under the leadership of Michael Benjamin at the University of Cardiff in the first decade of this century. And I think it's really defined how we understand enthesopathies in particular. And I, I was lucky enough to see him speak once at the American College of Sports Medicine and followed his work until he retired. And I think it's absolutely superb work that actually helps me as a clinician explain the complexity and the difficulty in treating plantar enthesopathy. So if we look on the left side at that blue colored slide, you can see that the enthesis uh, actually represents uh, a soft tissue bony interface. So you can look at the area which is labeled UF, which is uncalcified fiber cartilage, then there's just below it some calcified fiber cartilage and then a tidal mark that represents the distribution between the two or the interface between the two. If we move to this middle image, what we're actually seeing is some of the pathology associated with plantar enthesopathy. And that is that you get microscopic cracks in the fiber cartilage of the plantar fascia represented by those blue arrows. And so we're actually seeing histological disruption. And I think if one appreciates that, you can see how difficult it becomes to manage. And then on the right is the, the, the attempt of the body to heal, showing chondrocytes or cartilage producing cells at the enthesis that have formed proliferating nests, typically seen as a repair reaction that accompanies that wear and tear and then followed by repair. And we often see that in other uh, pathological situations such as osteoarthritis as well. And so I'll leave you with this image to say this is a complex area of damage that undergoes constant and repetitive load. And if one looks at the undersurface of the plantar fascia and you see the amount of compressive load, it's no wonder that you get this degree of histological damage. And taking that a step further, it's no wonder that it causes so much pain and ultimately a frustration for the clinician. So when we look at those predisposing factors that I alluded to, we can, like everything, divide them into, into intrinsic, which I've represented here, or uh, extrinsic causes, which are predominantly related to training overload and inappropriate footwear. And then, very importantly, there are some other associations which would fall under the intrinsic category as well, arthritis, diabetes, Paget's disease, which we should always bear at the back of our mind. These were some original cross-training shoes that I used, which resulted in my plantar enthesopathy at some stage, simply because the shoe type was too hard for the, the running that I was doing. If we look at predisposing factors, one of the frustrating things about the literature that informs us about plantar enthesopathy is that it doesn't tell us a lot. But one of the consistent findings in the literature, particularly as highlighted by this systematic review, is that people that are overweight have a greater chance of plantar enthesopathy, fasciopathy. And so high body mass index will certainly uh, be a greater predisposing factor than people who are fall within their prescribed weight range. 
And I think we've all seen this in people who are non-athletes as well, you know, that people that are carrying a lot of weight and present with the condition. It's purely because of the weight-related overload. In runners, we see a high incidence. It's a common, common running injury because of the repetitive microtrauma. It may be related to foot type, and I think Sean might cover that. Other biomechanical factors such as limited ankle dorsiflexion, and that might uh, feed into the effect it has on that windless mechanism. And then obviously excessive training, particularly sudden increases in the distance of the run, um, faulty running shoes, running on unyielding surfaces, and then prolonged walking or standing on hard surfaces. And when it comes to the training, as we know, these are quite tricky scenarios because certainly in the initial presentation of, of this condition, it often is alleviated by movement. And so as they start running, they actually feel that they're coping with the load and it's only afterwards that they feel the discomfort. And that discomfort comes in the form of heel pain. We're all aware of the classic presentation of that morning pain or pain after a period of inactivity, sitting in a meeting on a computer, then they get up after an hour, hour and a half and the heel is sore, but then starts improving as they become active again, but may deteriorate later. And then in the more severe cases, the pain becomes more persistent and consistent. And then the other test is pain with passive, door, uh, passive toe extension. The signs, there aren't many actually. So you might actually get some swelling. If you look carefully, the, the, the calcaneus is often swelling, swollen. Uh, but most commonly, there's tenderness on the medial side of the heel at the origin of the plantar fascia, and this may extend. And very importantly, as part of the examination, to, is, is to assess all those intrinsic and evaluate all those extrinsic factors. One of the areas where we get caught out quite often is that we label all heel pain as plantar fascia pain, and that can be a mistake. And I'm, I'm speaking to the converted in terms of the podiatry fraternity because you are acutely aware of the differential diagnosis. But particularly in clinicians who aren't seeing these a lot, and in lay people and athletes, runners in particular, all heel pain in their mind is plantar fascia pain. And you're going to miss a whole host of potential uh, differential diagnoses if you just label it that way. And I've listed some of these. And one has to be careful because in all of our careers, at some stage, we're going to come across most of these. And if we don't have a high index of suspicion, then we're going to end up in trouble. So don't miss these differential diagnoses, some of which are quite bizarre, like fibromyalgia and fluoride used for the treatment of osteoporosis. But uh, certainly in my practice, we see quite a lot, a high number of rheumatological associated conditions in people who are active, and that can manifest in the foot and ankle as well. And this requires further imaging and uh, blood evaluation as well. So what's my approach as a clinician? The same as my approach is for everything. And those of you that have heard me speak before will have seen this slide from when I first started giving talks in 1995. There's only three things you have to do as a clinician. The first is to make a diagnosis. Sorry, it's misspelled. The second is to treat the condition. And the third is to address the cause. Those are the only three things you have to do as a clinician. It's quite simple. And it starts with making the diagnosis because if you don't have a correct diagnosis, you're not going to be able to do the other two. And it's quietly, it's, it looks as simple as that, but that's really what outlines my philosophy in terms of treating these injuries. In terms of investigating them, it really has quite a low yield investigation. So you might do x-rays, which might show those osteophytes, but we know that up to a quarter of those are asymptomatic. It may help in including, excluding the differential diagnoses. Increasingly, I use ultrasound. I just use it a lot because it's accessible. It's in my rooms and uh, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, to go to other things like MRI and CT, you really have to justify why you're doing that. Uh, ultrasound, as I said, is very useful. Uh, it is, uh, shows up the plantar fascia nicely and is very, very useful to be able to show the patient in the rooms what we're dealing with. So that would typically be, if you look uh, on the right heel, 
The nice thing about most things in musculoskeletal medicine is you've got two of them, and hopefully one of them is normal for you to compare and uses your control. And we know that when we measure that in the long axis on ultrasound, the thickness at the origin of the plantar fascia should be no more than 0.4 centimeters. In this particular one on the left, you can see it's uh, point, nearly 0.6. You may pick up a tear in the plantar fascia as well, which is nice to show the patient. Um, and then in the transverse, you can often pick up those areas of degeneration in the short axis. This was an interesting case of a plantar fascia, which you can see was absolutely normal in thickness, well within the normal range in a young 20 year old aspirant professional golfer who had pain that was so bad at the, on the medial aspect of his heel that he could not complete a round of golf. Uh, and this was one of those areas which potentially caught us out because it was diagnosed and treated as a plantar fasciitis. And uh, when it was only when he failed to respond to normal treatments, which we'll go through now, that we delved a bit further and we thought, saw that he had other enthesopathies at the base of the fifth metatarsal uh, and uh, peritendinitis around the perineal tendons as well. And he turned out actually to be a case of ankylosing spondylitis and ended up on biologic agents prescribed by the rheumatologist. In terms of management of plantar enthesopathy, if you're looking for the silver bullet Tonight, you're not going to get it because there isn't one. So there's no quick fix or quick re resolution for this. And it's something that's eluded us for years. So we can look at different aspects of managing the pain. You can massage with ice. Uh, you can treat with ice, with massage, with heat in, in chronic cases. Change of shoe simply may do it. A cortisone injection, I've put in brackets because it's something that I don't like doing. Cortisone uh, injections for the plantar fascia are not a solution. They're not a solution because it's not an inflammatory problem. It's a degenerative problem. And corticosteroid exacerbates the degeneration. So taking a cortisone injection is a little bit like drinking shooters on a night out. It seems like a good idea at the time, and it gives you a quick fix, but it comes back to bite you later. So I don't think that's a good option. Offloading it is important. We spoke about addressing the causes and the most important aspect is activity modification, which is a fancy word for relative rest. Putting them to a boot is sometimes necessary. Crutches may be necessary. Shoe changes is often an option. Silicon heel cups, a well-fitted orthotic, taping, uh, weight loss okay, is very, very important in terms of the, the, the offloading mechanism. Stretching is useful, okay, and it's something that they can't really overdo. They need to stretch during the day, they need to split, stretch it at night with the use perhaps of a night splint or a Strasbourg sock. And then trying to stimulate healing. And the two things we used to do that are extracorporeal shockwave therapy, which also has a, an analgesic effect and platelet-rich plasma, which I'm going to allude to in the coming slides now. And then there's others that have been described, which I'm not really familiar with and don't use, but you will pick up in the, in the literature. Plantar enthesopathy gets better, 80% resolve in a year, but it's not a quick fix. And you're always going to be asked by the athlete, how long is this going to take? And I'm old enough now to give an answer that's very broad and gives me scope to allow them to heal because I know it's going to take time. So I use my answer to them is usually that plantar fasciitis, I, I use the, the colloquial term, takes months rather than weeks to resolve. And the other consistent thing with this is it's one of those injuries that does require rest you really are hardly going to get away with treating this on the run. Uh, and when I say rest, it requires at least a degree of activity modification, if not a period of complete rest from the activity which caused it. And it's something that's hard for us as sports and exercise physicians to swallow, and it's even harder for the athlete to swallow. 
but these very get very rarely get better without rest. There's a whole lot of exercises that are prescribed. I think many of them work. My only advice in terms of prescribing exercises for athletes is don't give them too many because they don't do them and they can't do them. So I usually give, a, give three or maximum four exercises that they can do. Uh, and those are all described and are very easily accessible in terms of trying to stretch out the plantar fascia and also strengthen some of the intrinsic muscles which might support the arch. The other thing I found quite useful, even temporarily, is to strap the arch. And I use quite a simple strap strapping technique, which just pulls the arch up from lateral to medial. I use some rigid strapping underneath, which I don't take all the way around the foot for con because of potential constriction. And I use a more elastic, uh, lighter strapping on top to hold it in place. And this works well if you're trying to treat it in active sports people. And it also helps with pain management. The one area that I've started using increasingly are platelet-rich plasma injections. And I'm going to speak a little bit to this. It's something that I've avoided for years, although the literature started producing case series that showed that it was more effective than corticosteroid injections, uh, which I stopped using a long time ago. Uh, but I avoided using it quite simply because it's the most terrible injection to both give and especially to receive. It's very painful. But the results certainly in our clinic have been quite phenomenal. And in the literature, increasingly, PRP is being shown to be useful. So I still have quite a high threshold for using it. But if those athletes haven't responded to our normal interventions, like addressing the mechanics, shockwave therapy, uh, and um, the, the exercise program, then I give an injection that's done under ultrasound. You can see the needle coming in here from the, sound, from the side um, and injecting into the degenerate area. It's not a pleasant injection. I usually give three of them, uh, but as I said, the results seem to be positive in terms of stimulating healing. I think in 27 years of practice, I can't have sent five patients for surgery for plant emphysopathy. It's, it's something that I very, very rarely responds to conservative treatment, um, but some surgical techniques are described, both open and endoscopic, but it's not something that I think makes the foot and ankle surgeons a lot of money. In ending, I just thought I'd show some pretty toes of one of my patients who completed her 10th comrades this year to earn a green number. And she came in uh, proudly to show me her, her painted nails a few days before. Um, and she actually successfully completed it. And that's one of the success stories uh, that we're all proud of in, in, in these sort of runners. So in concluding, I just really want to summarize that when we talk about plantar uh, fasciitis, it's not just another itis. It's not an inflammatory condition. It's a degenerative condition, which presents us with difficulties because of the unique anatomy and histology of the enthesis and the biomechanical function of the plantar fascia and its supportive function of the arch and the windless mechanism. As clinicians, we must be aware that most heel pain might be plantar fascia related, but don't miss the differential diagnosis. And every foot is unique, so customize your management approach. There's not a cookie cutter approach to this, except to say that rest will probably be part of it. Don't forget it's a degenerative condition. It can easily become chronic. The diagnosis is largely clinical. Don't throw expensive investigations at it unless you're battling. Treat the pain but always remember to address the causes, okay? The important ones being intrinsic weight, the overuse, training, shoe use, biomechanics, et cetera. And don't miss those differential diagnoses. So thanks very much for your kind attention. Um, we'll be certain to take questions uh, either now or at the end, whatever you choose, but uh, we look forward to the main act to Sean Pincus who will teach us a lot, I think, about the, the biomechanics. So thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks very much, John. That was fantastic. And I'm so glad that you spoke about um, that this is not an itis. Uh, it's not a true inflammation and that you really spoke into the histology because so much of that is missed um, and it's not very well understood i mean in the podiatry community it's quite big because we see it so much it's referred to us we treat the mechanics for it so thank you very much that was a wonderful talk um we'll keep i'll answer some questions live um those i feel i can answer otherwise i'll keep one or two poignant ones for john at the end if you have a specific one for john just say question for john in the q a Moving on to our second speaker tonight. Um, I'll make you blush a little bit, Sean, because I've known you since I was 17. <laughs> so, known you before. Don't go into you know, details. No details, please. <laughs> so, Sean um, is, a, we, we're very privileged to call you colleague. Um, we, he qualified in 1990. He now practices in Cape Town and he has just taken over the Sports Science Institute in Cape Town, the podiatry practice in there, which he's quite excited about. His main focus is podiatric biomechanics um, and orthotic design. He manufactures his own orthotics for um, digital orthotics for himself as well as for other podiatrists. He mentors many young graduates who come through. And I think the best way to describe you would be bakes bread, looks at feet and, you know, works on a mountain. So I'm looking forward to your biomechanics talk, Sean. Take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, uh, Asina, for all the sponsorship. And thanks to all the people who are sitting in front of me. So for those of you in Johannesburg, I've got about 50 odd people sitting in front of me. And uh, I've got Calvin, my tech guru over here to the side. Uh, thank God for tech gurus because I'm not one of them. Um, and uh, I, like I said earlier, I'm really looking forward to seeing the people in front of me turn off their videos and mute themselves because that's going to be the fun part. But you guys in Johannesburg got the benefit of that. So you are going to see me looking left to right because I've got my notes to the side. Unfortunately, the way this has worked out because we're coming to you live from Cape Town, I can't get my notes on the screen in front of me. So if I'm looking away and I'm looking a bit distracted, I'm not actually. I'm just trying to see what's going on. And interestingly, today is, if I'm not mistaken, International Podiatry Day, and the Federation of International Podiatrists put out a note this morning, and their discussion today is plantar fasciitis. So, and I promise I didn't organize that. I had no part in that. But the reality is plantar fasciopathy is probably one of the most common things we see in clinical practice. To those of us who treat feet, who are brave enough or stupid enough to treat feet, plantar fasciopathy is one of the things we're going to see the most. So... When we look at the word, the biomechanics of fasciitis, I'm going to ask a question, and John definitely alluded to this a lot, and I'm going to back him up 100%. It's not necessarily biomechanics of plantar fasciitis, but rather the pathomechanics that I'm going to be looking at, and the pathomechanics of plantar fasciopathy. So we perhaps need to have a little bit of a, a change in our narrative. So, and the next thing is, are we looking only at the fascia? And it's very fair to say that the fascia is very often not the only culprit causing heel pain. And again, John alluded to the fact that there's more than one differential and uh, there's a lot of anatomy around the area that can also be part and parcel of the pain. So Simon Bartold published an article where he said, should we not be going from plantar fasciitis and talking more about plantar heel pain as an umbrella term? But then again, we've got to say, diagnosis dictates management so you have to be very specific and again John and I are clearly on the same page as far as that so when I look at the discussing the pathomechanics of plantar fasciopathy you need to understand what's going on inside my brain and there's, there's a small brain it's not a big one but there's going on some stuff going on and there are a lot of paradigms that are used in podiatric biomechanics and there's more than one it started off with um, the windlass mechanism, which John discussed very, very well. If you're going to be treating plantar fasciopathy and you don't understand the windlass mechanism, you're automatically at a disadvantage. You need to understand that basically something is upsetting the functioning of the windlass mechanism. And that is why the fascia is becoming involved. So the understanding of the, 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 the windlass mechanism is essential. Uh, it was first described in 1950 by Hicks. And uh, it's paramount. It's got a very important jo job in ending the pronation phase. 
it supports the arch and it actually is part and parcel of the force that will resupinate the foot at the end of the pronation phase at the end of mid stance. So the windlass mechanism is key to understanding that in, in understanding the pathomechanics of it. Then there's something called root theory and around the world I can hear podiatrists gasping and horror and shock as I discuss the root theory. So the root theory is pretty much the basis and the cornerstone of where podiatric biomechanics started. Uh, however, I'm going to come on to a more complete mechanism, explanation of these, but that's the one, and I'll explain that to you now. Rotational equilibrium around the subtalar joint axis, and that was described by Kirby. Sagittal plane theory and functional hallux limitus was described by Howard Dannenberg. Uh, both of those are pretty much legends in the world of podiatry. Tissue stress theory was described by two Australian physiotherapists named McPoyle and Hunt. And then there's the neuromechanical theory by Ben O'Neig. And that theory is perhaps slightly more off the wall, slightly out there theory, but it actually is very valid when you're looking at understanding and creating a complete system of how you understand the pathomechanics of plantar fasciopathy. So the windlass mechanism first described by John Hicks in the 50s. And I said it's an essential part of how the, the, the arch is supported. And it's not just the fascia. Remember, you've got quite a few ligaments in the plantar surface of the foot that are also supporting the arch. You know, the windlass assists in ending the pronation phase. Remember, it's a structure that can stretch, but it can stretch to a point. And at that point, the pronation phase should be ending. As soon as you then enter the, the, the propulsive phase, as you, know, the, as you get dorsiflexion of the foot, the foot's actually dorsiflexing over the hallux. That winds the fascia around the, the metatarsophalangeal joints. That will resupinate the foot. It will cause what's called close packed. In other words, the calcaneal cuboid joint in the lateral column will close up. The foot will become a rigid lever, and the body is able to propel over that using the tricep surahs, one of the main propulsive forces, as well as functional hallux limiter. So the windlass mechanism is an essential part of the functioning of the foot. And if you understand there's any alteration in foot morphology or foot function can influence this natural function of the windlass mechanism, but it can cause it to fail. And if the windlass mechanism fails, it's going to cause force to go into the, the tissue at the calcaneal emphasis, and that's going to start the degenerative process. There are reasons why it can become suddenly overloaded, whether suddenly or repetitively, and that is also vital and vital understanding and understanding the path mechanics of plantar heel pain. So the root paradigm was based off of a work published. I'm just going to discuss these very quickly. So just to discuss each of these paradigms in, in, in whole, completely, we'll be at about three in the morning, but I'm going to just very briefly run and then you'll have to trust me in everything I say. So it was based on the work by Ruder, Ryan and Wheat, Weed, sorry. Uh, and it's basically a non-weight bearing foot is placed into a subtalar joint neutral position and they applied eight criteria of normalcy that were applied to the foot. The reality is, if you were to apply those eight criteria of normal, uh, normalcy to any human that you know, the only person that looks like that particular thing is going to be the tin man from the Wizard of Oz. Because the eight criteria cannot exist in a human. It's just not possible. However, despite my fact that I've, just, I've discredited it, and it has been discredited largely amongst the podiatric literature, um, most recently by Jarvis in, in 2017, uh, it does remain a nice way to get an overall guideline of the understanding the plantar shape of the foot. It provides us with a very good method to understand ankle equinus. Okay, and I'm going to discuss equinus in quite some detail a little bit later. And it provides a very good clinical tool for understanding the difference between structural and functional limb length discrepancy. And if you are wanting to look at why is limb length discrepancy an important part of the pathomechanics, how many people do we see that have got a unilateral fasciopathy? Limb length discrepancy where the structural or functional can be part and parcel of why there is a difference in uh, why you've got a unilateral issue. So rotational equilibrium around the subtalar joint axis was developed by Kevin Kirby. Kevin Kirby was actually a taught by Ruta, Ryan, and Weed. And he found that when he applied those eight criteria, he wasn't getting the results he wanted. So being quite a clever guy, he then looked at things differently, applied mechanics to it. He did a whole x-ray series. And he discovered that the subtalar joint axis is not necessarily in the same place. And it can be deviated laterally or medially. I'm going to come up a bit later now again. So that if the axis is deviated medially, any force distal and lateral to the axis 
will cause a pronatory moment around that, that axis. So the position of the axis becomes vital in understanding how the foot is going to function and how ground reaction force is going to affect the foot in its function. That gives a very good, there's a very good reliable method of, of locating the axis in the clinical setting. And it's something that I hope every podiatrist uses. And I'm happy to teach this to anyone who would like to know how to find the axis. Very simple, very cl good clinical technique. Once we know where the axis is, it does provide us with very good information on how to control the rear foot with our orthotics. If you look at this image, if you look at the one on the, in the center, that is essentially a normal subtalar joint axis. So I'm going to pull this down. No, that's not going down. Okay, so the middle one essentially represents the, a neutral subtalar joint axis. The one to the right is a laterally deviated subtalar joint axis. In reality, I don't see this much in clinical practice personally. Other people might see it more than me, but I don't see it often. And the one to the left is what we see most commonly in clinical practice, specifically with people with plantar fasciopathy, where the axis is deviated medially. If you were to look at an AP view of X, on an X-ray, the surgeons would tell us they've got Taylor dome uncovering. And you see the talus is located, it goes, can you can see the talus goes medial and plantar. So you will see that the talus is not necessarily lined up in the correct position. And what that does, it shows us where the axis is and that will then match our clinical assessment of where the axis is located. And what you can see is any force that a ground reaction force. Now remember, one of the operating systems that goes on in a podiatrist's head should be physics. And Newton's third law is prime amongst all of those. So if the body is putting a force into the floor, the floor is putting the same force back into the body. So ground reaction force is essentially Newton's third law. And if there's ground reaction force distal and lateral to the axis, it's going to cause a pronatory moment around that axis. Once we know where that axis is, we know how to counter that with an orthotic reaction force, moving the force to a different position. And my analogy here would be glasses. Where if you put a lens in front of somebody's eye, you change the way the light enters the eye, and that means that image is going to focus on, 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 on the retina. And orthotic just changes the way force enters the foot and moves force from being a position of being pathological to sometimes being restorative and or corrective. Sagittal plane mechanics, again, one of the big ones that I've used for many, many years, first described by Howard Dannenbergen, was actually discovered by him by accident. Out of, he was also a disciple of Root and used to make his orthotics exactly as Root described. And he once had a patient who, despite everything correct according to Root mechanics, this patient wouldn't get better. And in sheer frustration, he cut a hole straight through the orthotic under the first metatarsophalangeal joint, and the patient functioned normally. And after much celebration and tears, he realized that he'd onto something where he discovered the pathway to clearing up something known as functional hallux limitus, where the hallux will lock up in its function. It can have a normal range of motion, non-weight bearing, but in function, the hallux will lock up. And that brief block of sagittal plane mechanics, so as the person is moving, swinging their limb from behind the planted foot to ahead of the planted foot, the planted foot will not allow mechanic, the, the body weight to go progress. And that brief block can be anywhere from 50 milliseconds to about 100 milliseconds is sufficient to cause or to upset the apple cart and to put force into the aponeurosis. So you can get collapse of the medial longitudinal arch and the whole foot can collapse just from that position. Sagittal plane block can also occur at the ankle. So it's very important when you're assessing a patient, certainly from a point of view of creating an orthotic, is to understand how does the foot function in the sagittal plane. And remember that sagittal plane is essentially 70% of the movement of the foot. Only about 15% is in the frontal plane, being pronation, supination. So 70% of the foot is a, the greater part. But if that is blocked up, that force is going to go into a position where it finds the easiest pathway outward. Remembering that in any system that's moving, energy is being created. And if energy is there, it cannot be lost. It's merely going to go somewhere else. So blockage in the sagittal plane is vitally important in understanding the pathomechanics of, of, plantar, fascia, of plantar fasciopathy. The tissue stress theory, I'm going to dwell a little bit on this. First described, like I said, by McPoyle and Hunt, two Australian physiotherapists. 
it looks differently at the foot and not only the foot, I'd imagine all, all tissue, but it, how tissue responds and reacts to stress and load. Okay, and the theory looks more at a kinetic assessment rather than kinematics. So it's not necessarily the position of the foot. Now, everybody who's ever, go just go home and Google orthotics. And you're going to see a picture of somebody marketing a device where you'll see the body all crooked and then they put in their device and the body straight and we hear angels and harps and everything's fantastic and all is wonderful. It's not necessarily true. And orthotic doesn't have to change the position of a foot in order to fix it. All it has to do is reduce the stress and the load causing the injury. So that's where the tissue stress theory is quite an important one to look at as well. It's about time. What I mean by it's about time, it's the length of time load is placed into a structure. If load is placed into, into tissue, I want you to think of two analogies. The one is Eben Etzebet bearing down on me at full speed, hitting me in the chest. That is load hitting me at a very high speed, and it's a high load. I don't think I would survive. Okay, I think Eben would take me out. I, I, he might, but he will. The next one is I want you to think of very, very small amounts of stress into tissue, repeated hundreds of times. Now, remembering that a, a, a sedentary person walks 3,000 to 5,000 steps a day. An athlete is running 990 steps per kilometer. Multiply that by a 21K run. Multiply that by all the number of steps they've done in their training, and you can see how repetitive, small micro trauma can then compound to eventually become an injury. So it's, it's not necessarily about the time, the speed of the time. It the, can be the repetition of the times. So plant uh, tissue stress theory is about time. How many times has it happened? How quickly is it happening? What is going on? So if you look at this, and I'm going to try and explain this to you because this is going to be something that's a very interesting graph. And I'm actually impressed that I even know what I'm talking about when I look at it, to be quite honest. So stress and str at the bottom on the on the, the, the x-axis, it says strain. Okay. And Simon Spooner developed something called the zone of optimal stress. And if you look at this, this really explains tissue stress theory. So can you all see the cursor? Yeah, you can. Okay. So from this point here to that point there is normal linear and elastic tissues. That's where any tissue can survive completely within that zone. That's the zone of optimal stress. If we then take the tissue beyond that, it becomes elastic but no longer linear. And if you go beyond that, the tissue can deform. And this is true of any matter. Take a piece of plastic, take an elastic band, take metal, take anything. Anything will behave according to this. But in the plantar fascia, what I want you to think of is the plantar fascia being pulled apart by two bone points, by its origin and insertion, and that is causing the tissue to operate beyond its zone of optimal stress. And the tissue will eventually become disorganized and degenerate and break down. The neuromechanical theory, this is, like I said, is a slightly off-the-wall theory, but when you look at it and read it, it's actually not. It was developed by a guy by the name of Ben O'Nig, and Ben O'Nig is to biomechanics what David Attenborough is to the animal world. He comes from a Calgary University. He's published probably thousands of papers, exceptionally clever guy. And the neuromechanical, it's called the preferred motion pathway theory. Now, I want you to think of something. Take your shoes off, and you're going to run at five minutes a K straight down the, a tar road. Okay. Your brain is going to tell you that heel striking on a tar road, I'm not going to get into barefoot and minimalist shoes. This is not the forum for that. Okay. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> so think of running on that kind of thing down a hard tar road. Your brain is going to tell you that heel striking is not comfortable. You are going to alter your gait. Repeat that on grass. And your brain will tell you that you can do slightly something slightly differently. Repeat that on the beach. So what's going to happen is your brain is going to be giving you input. And without you consciously doing it, you are going to alter your gait to find a preferred pathway to, to function. So that is, a, like I said, a slightly off-the-wall theory, but quite important. And we see it, and I'm going to go on to the next couple of things, and I'll explain it further. So impact forces or impact signals that produce a reaction or adaptation adjustment of muscle activity or muscle tuning. And I'm not mistaken, he's not here. I think Martin Schwalness was quite into this a few years ago, looking at doing research into, into this. 
And a moment before contact, before heel strike, your brain will tell you, is this going to be comfortable or not comfortable? And you will alter something in order to do that. Impact, when your heel strikes, causes vibration of the leg and of tissue. All things in the world have a vibration frequency. So muscle is at 10 to 20 hertz. Bone is 60 to 2 kilohertz. Nerve, fascia, ligament, fat, I mean, um, um, tendon, everything has a different vibration frequency. And if the way you are functioning into the floor is creating resonance of that vibration frequency, it can also transfer and cause damage to tissue. When we assess patients, specifically the, the not so athletic patient with plantar fasciopathy, we often see a vibration going straight up the leg. And it's important when you see that vibe. So when you do a gait analysis, watch somebody walk, look at the moment of heel strike and you might see a vibration actually going up the leg. And if you're seeing that vibration, that can be, and I'm not saying it is, it can be that that is part and parcel of what is causing the disruption of the plantar fascia. So by putting something that breaks or dampens the vibration frequency or prevents resonance of the vibration frequency, that can provide some kind of healing. Very often people use silicon heel cups when they've got diagnosed with plantar, uh, with plantar heel pain. And the, plant, the, the silicon heel cup can just be dampening that vibration frequency. That can be part of its efficacy. So it's very important to look at, do you see that vibration frequency when you're doing the gait analysis on somebody with plantar heel pain or any condition? Uh, shin, uh, medial tibial stress syndrome would be a huge one. So I'm going to just show you three pictures. Well, so four pictures, I can't even count. Four pictures, and if you look at the top right, so our top left picture. So this one here where the guy's got blue chinos, what you can see there, you can see something called navicular drop and drift, and it's bilateral. So what we mean by navicular drop and drift is in stance, the ground reaction force is such that the navicular has dropped in its height, and it's drifted medially. So navicular drop and drift is very often a sign that there's great, a greater ground reaction force going into the foot, and there's a medially deviated subtalar joint axis. The medial longitudinal arch cannot cope and or the medial column can't cope and the foot is going to collapse. The next one, I want you to look at the one in the middle. That is ankle equinus, just typical of an ankle equinus. Uh, I haven't measured this. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can measure this, but very often just putting the patient prone, foot hanging off the bed, load the foot gently until you start feeling some kind of resistance. Does the foot get to... 90 degrees or preferably to 80 degrees, but in many, many cases, you will see that the plantar flexed and the foot is in equinus. The picture bottom left, this one here, never mind the callus around his heel, that's a sidebar, I'm not going to discuss that, but you can see that the forefoot is actually internally rotated. He's got a supinated forefoot. In the old days of root to rhine and weed, we used to call it a forefoot varus. The orthopedic surgeons are going to say, rubbish, that's not a forefoot varus. It's not, so it's a supinated forefoot or an inverted forefoot. But in reality, that might also be something called the lateral column equinus, and I'm going to touch on that just now. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, you can see a unilateral navicular drop and drift. And unilateral navicular drop and drift is very often seen in people with limb length discrepancy, and it can either be a response to a structural leg length difference, or it can be a cause of a functional leg length difference. So evaluating the patient accurately in terms of limb length discrepancy is very important when you're looking at understanding the mechanics of why that's happening. Which paradigm or philosophy or theory do I use? Well, it's really, it's an alphabet soup. And John definitely alluded this, to this is that each foot is different. So I use whatever is pertinent to each foot. And I'm going to specify, I use whatever is pertinent to each foot because very often I will design orthotics where the left foot and the right foot orthotic are not exactly the same. They can be designed completely differently because each foot needs something and you need to create a, a holistic overall approach. So the holistic approach is getting the patient managed by other disciplines. That's very important in managing plantar fasciopathy. But in terms of the biomechanical approach for orthotic design, orthotics don't necessarily have to be symmetrical because the body very often is not symmetrical. What are the features that we see commonly in patients with plantar fasciopathy? Well, ankle equinus is probably one of the biggest. When we look at ankle uh, look at patients, equinus of some form, and I'm going to, again, go to a bit more detail. Equinus is definitely one. We see it in pes planus, or flat foot, or arches collapsed. Uh, we see it in pes cavus. 
We're setting people with normal feet. They've got no apparent de deviation in terms of arch height. It can be in a completely normal patient. So there's no such thing as plantar fasciopathy happens in this kind of patient. And again, John used the phrase cookie cutter approach. There is no cookie, cookie cutter approach. We see differences in the forefoot shape in the frontal plane. That forefoot can be inverted, supinated, or pronated, and, and, or, and or everted. We look at the range of motion in inversion and eversion. Important to look at the whole, looking at the foot as, as specific units and creating a total model. Medial column instability, very, very important part of seeing what, of what we're seeing because it's the instability in the medial column that's going to be causing the increased load in the plantar fascia. Decreased muscular control of vibration, again, that is something that we can address. That will be the physio's job and the buyer's job. My job would just be to dampen that down with the orthotic. And then muscle strength, weaknesses or imbalances. Again, physio and or buyer, because you're going to find muscle weakness and or imbalance in people with plantar fasciopathy. How many people treat runners? Stick your hands up. Almost everyone in this room treats runners. How many of you treat runners who do strength training? About three. Okay. So in reality, every runner ever doesn't do strength training. So most of them are going to be weak somewhere. So Aquinas, we, when we talk about equinus, everybody thinks it's ankle equinus. But in reality, it can be in the ankle, it can be a short gastrocnemius, it can be soleus, can be osseous in the ankle. So that's the ankle. But we can also see it in the forefoot. So you get a forefoot only, that's in equinus. You can get the lateral column and or the medial column that's in more of an equinus position. And an individual ray can be in equinus. Usually the second, third, or fourth can be in equinus. And we can see what's called dorsiflexion resistance. So it's a new way to understand equinus as not just being something that's a position, but as something where there's a restriction of motion in the direction of dorsiflexion. So dorsiflexion resistance occurs in most structures in the foot, and there's a decrease in that range of motion. So any structure in the foot will have a range of motion, and we know how much dorsiflexion we need. If there's a restriction in that, we can say there's dorsiflexion resistance. And then we ask a whole lot of questions. Is there resistance in the direction of dorsiflexion in the ankle or any of the segments within the foot? Is it equinus? Is it muscular from a short gastrox and or soleus? And there's a way to tell the two apart. Or is it a combination of those two? Or is it an osseous block? Is the equinus in the forefoot only? Is it in the lateral column? Is it in one or more rays? Is there an equinus in the metatarsophalangeal joint? Very often you see that there's plantar flexion of the proximal phalanx, and that alone can cause Equinus of that joint can cause functioning and inc uh, incorrect function around that joint. And what she's going to see is that because you've got restriction in one motion, the, the force is going to go somewhere else, causing a moment around that block point. So if we look at this, you've got on the top left, you've got the lateral column, the, the, that called a lateral column and medial column. And in reality, a column is a vertical structure. These are beams. Okay. And we know that the tricep sura attaches only proximally to the calcaneus, but there's no direct function of the tricep sura on the medial column. But a lot of structures, and most of the structures we're looking at, go from the lateral column to the medial column. So things like, obviously, the plantar fascia, abductor hallucis, quadratus plantar, there's quite a few muscles that go from the lateral column to the medial column. And if the lateral column is not functioning correctly or there's dorsiflexion resistance, that force will go to the medial column. Also, if you've got a lateral column equinus, as well as immediately deviated subtalar joint axis, ground reaction force that is now distal and lateral to the subtalar joint axis will cause a pronatory moment that's going to go into the medial column. So very important to look at where exactly are we dealing with, because we're looking at understanding the mechanics of how that injury is happening and how we're going to be treating it. When you're going through all of this and you're going to go back to it, you're going to say, do I need to send my patient for orthotics, yes or no? So if you're seeing things like equinus, you should be saying, do we need a, a podiatrist to assess our patient? Again, looking at the picture on the top right, we're looking at each of the individual rays. If a ray is blocked in its function, that can then start causing dysfunction around that specific ray. If we think of a train, if one part of the one set of wheels in the train doesn't function, the entire train is not going to work properly. So the whole foot has to function in sync with itself. Everybody talks about plantar fasciopathy being in pes planus, but it does occur in pes cavus. 
remembering that you do get, everyone thinks that Pez, Pez planus is a flexible foot, Pez cavus is a rigid foot, and nothing could be further from the truth. You see flexible Pez cavus, and you see inflexible or rigid Pez, Pez planus. So going through and having a look at those patients and seeing what's happening and understanding where the restrictions of motion are taking place will guide us as to how we're going to be designing that orthotic. Four foot shapes. I spoke earlier about uh, inverted or, or, or supinated four foot position, and you saw a picture of that. That's very often lateral, lateral column equinus as well. And an everted or pronated, what was called a four foot valgus, it's not actually, that's an incorrect terminology from root, but an everted or pronated forefoot, those can cause motions and movements around the foot, causing um, pronation or supernatory moments as the foot's moving forward. And as the foot go, moves forward, that can cause force loading into the plantar fascia. Uh, pronation, I'm going to talk a little bit. So if we just go back to the slide, you'll see there's TED is in red. You see that? So TED is a position or a shape. Pronation is a motion that results from that. Now, pronation, I've put there, you see there's 666. Calvin didn't know what I was talking about, 666. 666 is the universal sign of the devil. Because everybody thought that if your foot pronated, you were doomed to a life of hell and everything was going to go wrong with you. The reality is pronation and supination are absolutely normal movements. They need to happen. They both need to happen. And there's a time sequence about the way they happen. But if the pronation phase doesn't end, then you're going to get overload into the plantar fascia. That's one of the structures that can be involved. Remembering that, that it's not only the plantar fascia that can be involved, but we're talking about that now. So we talk about excessive overpronate, under supinate or flat foot. And the truth is we don't know what a normal amount of pronation is. No research that I've ever seen says you must pronate by four degrees or six degrees or whatever they say. You can get people functioning completely normally with a complete flat foot. They're absolutely fine. They have no injuries. So if we can't define what normal is, how do we define what's abnormal? And very often people say, I have an abnormal amount of overpronation. So we don't know how to do that. The same with supination, excessive, you fail to pronate, which is actually a real problem because if you're failing to pronate, you're going to be putting increasing, increasing amounts of load into the fascia and into the plantar structures or you underpronate. These are terms, I don't know where they came from, but they're out there, I've seen them very often on Facebook or YouTube or other places like it, solid places for good advice. Okay. Then we look at the range of rear foot motion, inversion and eversion. And what I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk too much about this, again, inverted or everted versus inversion and, ever, uh, and eversion. So a position versus a, a motion. When you're looking at designing your orthotics, if there's a restriction in the amount of inversion or eversion, you can't be placing a force under the foot, under the foot of an orthotic that's going to counteract that. So I'll give you an example. If somebody's got a limitation and they have no eversion available, you cannot put a lateral hind foot wedge into that patient because all you're going to be doing is taking force that can't go through that joint and you're going to transfer it to another joint. The only time I would do that would be osteoarthritis of the knee, another discussion, not for tonight. So you need to be assessing the patient when you're looking at them mechanically, how much, what is the range of motion and inversion and eversion? And if there's not sufficient of one or another, that becomes part and parcel of your understanding of how to correct that. It can also be part of your understanding of, of the, the understanding of why is that patient getting plantar fasciopathy. Medial column instability. Uh, it's a consequence of a combination of things. So medial column instability is something that we see it causes chaos in the foot. Pretty much, I think 50% of the pathology we see in the foot is going to be coming from a plantar a medial column instability. And it's a combination of an equinus and or lateral column equinus, the foot shape, ground reaction force, and muscle weakness. And the medial column is incompetent in maintaining its stability against the ground reaction force. And what you'll find with a patient like this, if you were to look at them, is the lesser tarsus, basically the calcaneus and navicular, will be plantar flexing at a time when the foot should be a rigid structure. The middle of the foot, the mid tarsus, cannot cope with that. So the distal part of the foot, your metatarsal and, and your cuneiforms, are actually dorsiflexing, and the rear foot is plantar flexing, and the mid tarsal joint cannot cope with that. So you get a medial column instability or a collapsed arch. 
that would be one of your things that's going on at collapsed arch. Is it the arch that's collapsing or is it the medial column that is incompetent and not able to handle the ground reaction force that's going on? Muscle strength, weaknesses or imbalances. And the foot cannot control ground reaction force. The foot will go into a position that will transfer force proximally up into the, the knee and into the hip. If the muscles in the knee and the hip cannot control that force, you're going to get problems further down the line. So the foot can control proximally. And if you are weak in your hips and your knees, that can cause your foot to collapse medially. So when you're looking at a patient to just look at the foot and say, you have a flat foot, therefore you need orthotics, you need to be looking at the patient saying, you have a flat foot, you need to be going to the physio and or the bio and strengthen your knees and your hips. So you've got to look at them mechanically in a holistic manner, not just at the foot itself. Poorly controlled ground reaction force is transferred proximally to soft tissue structures and foot posture causes instability in the knee and the hip. And you need to address all of that. So looking at the patient, one of the tests I use single leg static stance. Can a patient stand on one leg and balance easily? You'll be surprised how many people cannot stand and balance on one leg. Look at the position of the knee. Does the knee rotate medially when they're doing a half squat or doing a squat? So there's a lot of tests that you can do that's going to look at strength and control in and around the hips. And I alluded earlier to runners not doing strength training. Most runners are going to go out and saying, I've got to do my 50 minutes or 100 minutes or 21 Ks, whatever the length of their run is. And they've got a plantar fasciopathy. And you say, how much strength work do you do? And they stare at you blankly because they're not doing any strength work. So that's part, you know, that's part and parcel of the problem. Real-time statements that I've had from patients, and these, some of them are real, really true. Uh, I have spurs, I have heel pains called calcania dynia. Calcania dynia is a fantastic word. It means sore heels. I have, it's a plantar frustratus. That's a word coined by a physiotherapist sitting in this room. And that is in reality what we're treating because you can do everything right. Absolutely everything right. And the patient does not respond. And if the patient's not responding, I'm going to go to what John said earlier. You need to widen the search. There are around 47 diagnoses for heel pain alone. And if plantar treatment of the plantar fascia is not giving you results, you need to widen your search. And very often, medial heel pain is not only in the plantar fascia. You can find it in what's known as Tom, Dick, and Harry, post-tib flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, abductor hallucis, more structures in the mid, more the, the plantar muscles of the foot, you know, uh, flexor digitorum brevis. You can find nerve entrapments. You can find all sorts of things. So if you're treating the plantar fascia alone and singly, you might find you're going to come short. So you've got to start having a look at all of the structures in and around the foot and see where you can find the problem. Diagnosis does dictate management. I need prosthetics. I need orthoptics. I don't know what an orthoptic is. I need orthodontics. Inners, inlays, footbeds, and my personal best, and this is in quotation marks because it came off my website, I need aesthetics for my platus vasculitis. And I, that was off my website. And to conclude, I'm going to do, talk about the, the plantar fasciitis is simple in its complexity and complex in its simplicity. Now, that may sound like a very ambiguous phrase, but again, it goes to exactly what John was saying. It sounds like a simple condition. You've got something that's causing disorganization of tissue around the calcaneal emphasis. But when you delve deeper, there's often very complex mechanics that's causing the problem. And there's more than one structure involved. So you have to start spreading the search and understanding fully what's going on so you can tailor your treatment to get the, the desired result for the patient. And yes, majority do respond within a year. But when you're dealing with a runner who's three weeks out of Cape Town Marathon with plantar fasciopathy, they want results now. They're not prepared to wait six or eight weeks to get better. So rest, all of the things that you need to do, but the, the sooner we understand the mechanics of it, the easier it can be to start working and designing a treatment plan that should be holistic. Orthotics are part of a holistic treatment plan. So you've got to do as much as possible. Sometimes ch chuck the kitchen sink at them to see if you can get them right. But it is a very difficult, very frustrating condition to treat and we sometimes don't get the results that we want. And I'm going to finish with a hopefully a humorous story of Auntie Dora because Auntie Dora is going to really sum up absolutely everything 
about plantar fasciopathy that we've discussed tonight. And Auntie Dor Dor Dorothy Carruthers lived in Ilova in Johannesburg, and she suffered for years from plantar fasciopathy, had heel pain for years. And her, her, her children were telling me about this. And I said, well, what treatment did she have? Did she see an orthopedic surgeon? They said, absolutely. She saw the best. She saw the professors. And all the professors told her to do was to roll her foot over a plumber's pipe and to wear a heel cushion and ask her foot. I said, did she get better? She says, no, well, she didn't think it was a good idea. And for that kind of money, she, from a professor, she thought she should get a better result. I said, did she see a physiotherapist? I said, absolutely. She saw a physiotherapist. She saw the best. Now, what did they do? She said, no, they rubbed her calf and they gave her some exercises. I said, did that help? I said, no, she, she didn't like exercising and she thought that just rubbing her calf was not going to make a difference. So she didn't do anything further. I said, did she ever go to a chiropractor? I said, yes, she went to the chiro. She saw the best. A chiropractor clicked her ankle and he, he did something and it, it felt better for a day or two, but then it stopped. I said, did they ever put needles into your foot? No, she was terrified of needles. Couldn't, couldn't put any needles into Auntie Dora. She was terrified. So what else had happened? Did she ever see a podiatrist? Yes, she saw the best. He made her a pair of pathetics, but she couldn't wear them. I said, why couldn't she wear them? She said, no, because she wore a very specific type of flat pump that she got from you know, a pair of Kurt Geiger pumps that she got from, from a and &E Spitz. She couldn't wear the pathetics that she was made. I said, so what treatment worked? She said, one day she was on, on Facebook and she found a group called They Say. And what did they do? So They Say said she needs to go to a working cattle farm and follow a red heifer. And when the red heifer drops a lump, she should put her foot into this warm lump and that'll work. I said, did it work? I said, well, two weeks later, she stopped complaining. I said, how come she stopped complaining? She said, she died from septicemia and stopped complaining. <laughs> so that pretty much sums up the treatment of plantar fasciopathy. Sometimes we do everything. Sometimes we do everything right, but we need to understand the mechanics. We need to understand the pathomechanics. And we need to all work together as a combined group to try and solve the mystery of plantar fasciopathy. Thank you so much, Sean. That was a brilliant talk. <laughs> I'm, I think that we've got a fantastically comprehensive um, outline of what plantar fasciitis actually is and how we should be looking to treat it. John, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that. No, it was an outstanding um, detailed talk of, of the biomechanics. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. And uh, yeah, I just think the take home message is, you know, uh, have an approach and just understand that it's not always uh, as simple as people are making out. I've got um, just one or two questions here. I haven't had any for you yet, Sean. I don't know if you have any in the room with you. I'm just going to quickly do the ones that are on the panel here. From Jared to John, with regards to cortisone injection, if a patient has had two, um, has had two so far and is seeing a doctor that continues to give them, I know the answer to this question already, is there a number of cortisone injections that is too much and which would need a second opinion for treatment plans? So the cynical answer is that one is too many, um, but I think in all seriousness, there are risks of injecting the feet with anything, okay? Uh, infection top of the list. So I would be very wary of multiple injections, particularly with a steroid. The second point is if you're repeatedly doing a steroid injection, you're not solving the problem and you need to ask a question as to why you're doing this. And the, the, you know, the, the third thing is you're actually starting to do harm because of the degenerative effects of the steroid. Remember that corticosteroids are catabolic steroids. They're not anabolic uh, like the other ones which the, the bodybuilders use. So you don't, why well, put a catabolic substance into a tissue where you're requiring an anabolic response? It doesn't make sense. So, yeah, I, I mean, and I, I don't want to sound holier than now. I've given cortisone into plantar fascias before, but you really, really have to convince me that you need that quick pain relief. I've done it for that reason. If someone is so sore, they can hardly put their foot on the ground. And my ultrasound shows me significant inflammatory response around that. 
and I've excluded other causes and infections. And sometimes in those who have arthritis as well, it can sometimes be useful, mm. but I would be loath in a true plantar fasciopathy and thesopathy to be given any cortisone, let alone more than one. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, using shockwave therapy, how many treatment sessions do you recommend for your patients? And is your treatment aimed to treat the foot with the highest bar pressure and intensity that the patient can tolerate? So the first thing is to remember shockwave is part of the solution, possibly. It's not the ultimate solution. My answer, direct answer would be at least three treatments before you've given it a chance. But Generally, between three and six is sufficient to give that patient a response. Some patients will insist on coming back for more if they feel that there's benefit. These patients are very sore. So shockwave is not a pleasant experience, particularly in the beginning. So I start on a very low level, sometimes even sub-therapeutic, sub to start getting that analgesic effect and then move up from there. So I would say I would be very loath to go for the highest Pressure, I think between two and three bar is therapeutic and enough. I don't think you need to go higher than three bar and just blast it for the sake of it. Um, so that would be my approach. Okay. I've got another question here, which maybe both of you can comment on if you want. Um, it's by Dr. Pele. Uh, there's been a numerous shockwave, you know, interventions, failure, podiatric change, um, initi initiated changes, physio, etc. Um, and there's a clinical plantar nerve involvement. Um, is the use of related meds in these scenarios like gabapentins after the failure of all other conservative approaches? Um, there's no evidence, but he says it seems effective. Um, and nerve conduction often not, um, often not um, useless, useless enough. Is there, uh, would there be a significant neurological component in this? Uh, you know, is there a use for neurological modulators? I mean, I think in the case of a true plant enthesopathy, it's probably not necessarily neurological, but if there's huge inflammation, it might involve nerves in the area. And there's, as we've discussed, both of us have discussed, there's a differential diagnosis, some of which may be nerve related in which case those agents may be of benefit. So I don't think that in the a scenario where you failed with other interventions directly targeting the enthesopathy, that there's any harm in trying some of that approach to see if there's a benefit. Um, I certainly think in a complex heel pain syndrome, that might be one of the solutions. Okay. Um, Chris has also said uh, he's had cortisone injections, platelet injections, shock therapy, physio, nothing helps. I'm a runner and it's put me out of action for six months. I think the first question I have is, have you seen a podiatrist? Yeah, I mean, I if, you guys agree with uh, me. Sean, Sean said to it, look, you know, broaden your scope and field. I mean, I think just go back to my approach, you know, diagnosis, management, addressing the causes. Have we got the diagnosis right? I mean, in that case, I'd go for more advanced imaging, bloods, et cetera, and just make sure we've got the diagnosis correct uh, in that situation. Sean, I don't know if you want to add anything there. No, I'd go concur with everything you're saying, because if somebody's been treated for six months for plantar, for calcaneal enthesopathy, and nothing has changed after six months, you're missing something. So you need to go back and reassess that patient completely from the start and see what are you missing. And if you think that there's a neurological component, you know, assess for it. You know, there's quite a few nerves that run quite close to that area. You know, some pretty big nerves, like you know, posterior triple nerve, medial calcaneal nerve, Baxter's nerve. All of those can become entrapped and can cause pain. But they have specific appearances that might be there. So if you're seeing somebody who's got a neurological type of pain, then yes, refer to the neurologist and take it further that way. But certainly, if you after six months of treating calcaneal enthesopathy and hiding it away with cortisone, the patient is still in discomfort and pain. You need to go back to the drawing board, and you need to get a diagnosis, 100%. Diagnosis dictates management. I noticed there's a, there's a question here between plantar fasciitis and menopausal women. I think in my practice, I've noted an interesting correspondence um, to 
particularly uh, acute plantar fasciitis in ladies. As soon as we, so we'll do a shoe change, we'll have a, we'll have a change in that it will reduce by 60%, but there's a niggle that we can't get down enough. And um, funny enough, as soon as we start doing core work and strengthening glutes, the whole mechanical chain changes. And um, it's very similar to our orthotics talking about mechanics and it starts to offload. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other specific thoughts regarding that. You bring up a good, a good point, Lauren, and that is that, you know, change of life scenarios, and I'm not just talking about uh, menopause, but things like pregnancy as well, exactly. you know, change the body systemically. No, it's not just weight. So hormonal changes are really quite significant in terms of the effect they have on weight and on soft tissues. And we've described both of those as being central to this condition. So it's not uncommon to get ladies in menopause presenting with this problem. And it's very common to get ladies during and after pregnancy presenting with this problem for those reasons. So again, that holistic approach in terms of managing the patient is very, very important. Exactly. It's not just one thing is going to solve it. So there's quite a lot of questions here. I'm going to do two more and then we're going to, we're going to call it. Um, here's one here from Nicola. Along with the holistic treatment of lower limbs, we've had good results, including heavy, slow resistance training protocol and the treatment approach. Have you had any experience with um, this heavy, slow resistance training protocol for plantar fasciopathy or any thoughts around it? I think I'm going to take this one. So there is a lot of research out now that says basically the plantar fascia is not necessarily fascia. It's more closely linked to being a tendon and or ligament type structure, which means it functions similarly to the tendon continuum. And we know that with any form of tendinopathy, when you load it, it gets better. So there are ways to specifically target the load into the plantar fascia. So saying you're going to go with a loaded program or program of loading, building up load into the fascia can definitely yield results. So that is definitely something that people should be doing is looking at that and looking at, again, John said exactly, it's not fascia. It's actually a, a ligamentous tendinous structure. So the, the histologically, it's the same. So if you can then start targeting tenocytes to start changing and being able to, to bear, uh, bear load, you're going to start improving the patient. For sure. I've actually had... I'm so glad we're talking about this because I've had a um, one of my reps approach me with a cushion. What the cushion does is it dorsiflexes the hallux into an activated windlass mechanism. And then you go up onto the toe. So you activate the windlass mechanism by dorsiflexing that under a cushion. And funny enough, a, a patient that John and I are sharing um, along with our physio Eloise Mellet, um, where we've we've done shockwave we've done physio we've done orthotics we've done shoes and he's just getting a bit stuck and we actually implement I, I put this cushion into him and it's been chalk and cheese loading that fascia and i actually use this as one of my last resorts um well, i've been experimenting more with it in terms of that activated windless mechanism or loading properly of the fascia and that we get a very very positive result um contact me if you if you want that special cushion there's actually a supplier in Joburg who does it um, I can't think of his name or pan at the moment. One more question. Is... Murmurs. Helene. So Helene Simpson saying there's an article by God, upload me Scotty's the article, and it talks about exactly that. It's exactly that. It's dorsiflexing the hallux and then you've just got to be careful because I've had a patient do this. Make sure you do it on a softer surface because they can rupture their plantar plate. Yes. So the cushion is actually designed that you step on the plantar plate. It's, it's actually brilliant. Um, I'll try and post a link to it. I'm going to do one more question from Kirsten. 50-year-old, 54-year-old, slightly overweight, about 7 kgs, presents with plantar fasciitis, treated with physio, not much change. Goes off and hikes Hermanus Camino, 15 kilometers for five days. Absolutely no pain in the, shoe, in the same shoes that she walks around in her normal day. Returns to Joburg, pain returns. Thoughts. Come live in the Cape. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah, I think that's a complex one. I, I you know, I, I mean, I'd like to. I mean, I'm not avoiding that question. I just think it's a complex one to answer. 
um, and I'm happy to chat to Kirsten, who I know well. Um, uh, Andrew Stratum's posted an interesting question, which I'd like to just, or comment, I'd like to comment yes. on. He, he said, isn't there a spectrum of plantar fasciopathy, which includes inflammatory uh, you know, causes? And, and he, he cites MRI scans that show inflammatory changes extending into the calcaneus. So absolutely, I think there's a spectrum. But I think because of the nature of the condition, quite by the time we get them there, then there's most often a degenerative component. And that calcaneal involvement is very real. And I think it, it, it actually mimics a stress reaction in the calcaneus. When you see it so hot on an MRI scan that it's almost like a bone stress reaction. And I do think that there's a spectrum and that's why they're difficult to, to, to treat. And I, if you get them early enough, then I think an anti-inflammatory approach of one sort or another might definitely bear fruit. But with many of them with a degenerative component, it's very difficult to resolve them just with anti-inflammatory involvement. So it is an interesting situation and it really speaks to that spectrum of pathologies and the individualized approach that we've alluded to. Yeah. Fantastic, guys. Thank you so much. There's no more questions from Cape Town, I'm assuming. No questions? Anyone? No, they're all up to date, all up to speed. Very clever bunch here. Not one quit. <laughs> Yeah, you've jumped ship quickly, Sean. Eh? No, it's a 13 year jump. It's taken me 13 years. We've still got to have the, what's it, the, the challenge where you've got to come walk Biscop stairs and I'm going to come walk those other flat stairs. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much to both of our speakers for wonderful talks. Um, really, they've been yeah. really, really informative, and I think we've had some great questions from it. Um, uh, what I will do is, uh, those of you who want that cushion information, I will try and post it as an additional link um, onto the YouTube recording of this um, webinar, which you can go and find online on the WISH YouTube channel. And join us next time uh, for our next uh, WISH webinar, which is coming up, which Paris is running. So those of you who don't know, uh, Paris and I run the runners group together, and um, she will be hosting the next one, which is on runners and tendons. It's going to be fantastic. It should be in conjunction with the, ten, the Wish Tendon group as well. So please save the date for that and register for that webinar. Thanks for joining us tonight.